Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Naples Mac user group meeting, December the 23rd, two days before Christmas. Merry Christmas to every one of you and a uh, happy new year. We'll see you next week. So we can wish you a happy new year next week. Uh, we wanna welcome all of our members from all around the world and throughout the United States and Canada. Um, all of our meetings are exactly at the same time each and every Wednesday, scheduled now all the way through June 30th, uh, 2021. All of those that uh, view our meetings on Zoom uh, must be members of Naples Mac user group for security reasons. Our classes have been opened uh, since November 1st for registration. So make sure you sign up. The first class um, will be on uh, January 9th by Rosemary Orchard, who will come to us all the way from Vienna. And uh, Rosemary is going to cover Zoom. Um, there is no other tool that has brought people closer together than Zoom. And I think we should all be, um, even though it's made in China, we should all be grateful for the fact that um, Zoom has been with us all these months so that we have been able to continue communication with one another. Uh, same news as last week, continue to hold off on installing Big Sur. Uh, I'll let you know in a couple of weeks and uh, I'll be talking with Dennis and Jeff and probably within 13, 14 days, we'll be able to go ahead and install. Uh, you will receive a survey monkey monkey ballot, which is the election for the uh, Naples Mug Board of Directors sometime the beginning of January. And uh, you will be voting for our, our uh, open openings on the board and the voting will end and please have the ballot back to us by January 22nd. Marsha will talk next week a little bit more about it. If you have to uh, contact anybody, anyone in reference to Zoom, the expert is our Vice President uh, Eckert, and uh, things seem to be going rather smoothly at the moment. And um, but if you have any questions or any any issues with uh, Zoom, uh, feel free to uh, contact Eckert. Uh, on January the sixth, uh, we have a very very special meeting, and I'd like. Uh, uh, she if she could to talk about it. She arranged the meeting, and uh, this is going to be a, a once in a lifetime type meeting for um, for Naples Mac user group. And Sheeta, will you talk about it, please? Yes, uh, we are going to have Terry White, who is the principal worldwide design and photography evangelist for Adobe, at our meeting, and we are going to open up this meeting to other members. And uh, I've sent an uh, email to the leaders of groups and please take advantage of this. And if you have other leaders that you know who would like to be in, uh, have their group involved in this meeting, please do. Uh, Terry and I have known each other for almost 30 years. Uh, we're very good friends. And I asked Terry a couple of months ago if he would do a meeting for us. And he agreed and I'm very excited. Uh, Terry is a great friend and he does amazing presentations. And I think it will be a great treat for you. So I hope you join us and I look forward to the presentation in January. Thank you. Thank you. On uh, December the 30th, which is uh, next week, uh, we will have uh, Josh Summers with us who will be coming to us from Asia. He lives in Asia since I guess 2006. And um, you're going to really enjoy this meeting. This guy is a, a real expert on um, privacy and VPN and so forth. And uh, this will be an extremely interesting meeting. Today's meeting um, is Derek's story. Derek, Derek is coming to us from uh, Los Angeles, I believe, Los Angeles, California. Um, when I became interested in Derek actually about 20 years ago, and that's when I first uh, purchased my first Mac. At the same time, 
I got married to my current wife and I became extremely interested in um, uh, video and photography, uh, editing and so forth. And uh, at the time um, I joined lynda.com and Derek was one of the instructors that I spent hours and hours and hours watching his tutorials. And um, I, I'm not sure if you've been with us before or not, but I know over the years, I was always interested in trying to get Derek to talk to our group. And we're thrilled to have you and welcome aboard and it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a great user group, it looks like. And uh, of course, now Zoom has uh, made it possible for me to visit user groups all over the world. So <laughs> there you go. Another uh, plus side of what's a very difficult situation right now. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about street photography today. And uh, the reason why I'm going to talk about uh, this particular topic in part, uh, George asked me, he saw, I think, a post that I did maybe on Medium. I'm a writer for medium.com uh, or maybe somewhere else uh, about do uh, wearing masks, does that change the equation for street photographers? Because being recognizable you know, is one of the things that we deal with when we take pictures of people, because if they're not recognizable, we can use the photos one way, and if they are recognizable, then that's a whole different set of conditions. And I was just sort of curious that now that people are wearing masks, does that change the category when they're looking at us directly to unrecognizable? And so uh, George contacted me and I thought, well, I'll talk a little bit about what I call non-confrontational street photography. And the reason why I call it that is because I think for some folks, there's this notion that street photography uh, has to be this sort of this edgy sort of thing. We all dress in like a black hoodie and have a have a, a knit cap down over our head and we walk around and we just, you know, we have the right to do anything that we want as photographers. And if people don't like it too bad because we have the constitution on our side. And yes, we do have a lot of latitude in public as photographers. But I will also say that uh, I've noticed, and I've been a photographer for a long time, that over the past few years, the tone has changed in terms of how people view uh, people taking pictures in public, and then I think even among photographers themselves. And so when I did my last street photography workshop, which was in LA in March, right before the door closed, here in California uh, for shelter in place, uh, you know, I was talking about, okay, what if we took a different approach and I taught a different approach to working with people and getting uh, pictures out on the street? That's what I'm gonna talk about today. Now, uh, I'm gonna go, or I'm gonna cover five categories that I tend to work in when I'm out working in urban environments. So those are portraits with permission, and that's what we're going to start out with today. Uh, portraits without permission or permission isn't necessary. That's the second category. Uh, public artwork, which uh, I'm always fascinated by. Architecture, uh, and I think I include architecture in street photography because, you know, we want to tell a broad story. We want to tell a story. And just like with any movie or any uh, television show, uh, having you know establishing shots and context really help make the tighter shots make more sense. So architecture for me is always a part of it. And then the fifth category I call sign of the times. All right. So and uh, that's a little bit of a catch-all, but uh, you'll see why I like that category so much uh, as I show you pictures which we're going to do right now. All right, so let me just go ahead and get this sharing set up. We're gonna to go to this, we're gonna share this. And I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Are we doing good? Yes, we are. Yeah. Yes, good, all right. All right, so we're gonna start out with uh, portraits with permission here. 
And uh, uh, we're going to begin our story in uh, Los Angeles, uh, which was a very interesting place to be right at the beginning of the pandemic when folks didn't really quite know what was going on in terms of being locked down and, you know, how dangerous the situation was. We knew it was dangerous, but I don't think we had our head around it completely yet. And so what I call portraits with permission is I think one of the hardest things for photographers in my uh, workshops to get their head around, because it means that you actually interact with people first. In other words, you just don't run up and take their picture and run away, <laughs> or you don't use a long telephoto lens. I don't even allow long telephoto lenses in the workshop. Uh, take a picture of someone from a distance and then you know pretend like you didn't take a picture. This is actually engaging with the person and then saying, hey, can I take your picture? And then uh, doing a photograph. And I really like this approach. And uh, I will tell you, a lot of pure street photographers aren't as crazy about this approach because they feel like, well, you know, if, if you interact with them, then you've changed the shot. And I'm thinking, yeah, I have changed the shot. I've made it uh, more personal. And so, and then there's something just nice about having the person's permission to do the photo. And I think the thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize is that most people will give you permission <laughs> to take their photo if you build some sort of rapport with them first. So how do I do that? Well, I have the camera out, first of all, and I use two types of uh, cameras and we'll actually talk a little bit about gear in a minute. But uh, for these shots, I'm using a Fujifilm X100V, which I just, I just love that camera and, and so many, for so many reasons. And then uh, the other camera that I think is really useful right now is the iPhone 12 Pro Max. You know, so if you have those two devices, that's all I carry. I travel very light, light but I do keep the camera out. And uh, if I notice someone that I think is interesting, uh, I engage with them. I ask them, you know, hey, how are you doing today? How's it going? Uh, and just right away, you can get a feel for where they're coming from, right? Right away, either they don't want to talk to you at all, or, you know, they'll engage. Like, for instance, this uh, gentleman right here, he owns a bar, uh, actually in uh, Santa Monica, I believe. Uh, no, actually, uh, it, no, this, yeah, in Santa Monica. And he was out walking, you know, to his bar. He had run an errand, taken something out to the trash or whatever. And I said, this artwork on this bar is crazy. And he goes, yeah, it's my bar. And I go, it is, how are you doing right now? And so then we talked a little bit about, you know, already he was feeling the impact of the pandemic and everything. After really only about a minute of discussion, I go, do you mind if I take your portrait? I, I love your bar. Uh, you know, I, I love you in front of your bar. You know, this is just a really nice shot. I'm an enthusiast street photographer and this is my hobby and this is what I enjoy doing. And nine out of 10 times, seriously, I, I will get a yes. And the thing that I like about these portraits is that I get eye contact. I get eye contact and I sort of get a little bit of a feeling for who this, these people are. And go ahead and take the shot. Now, a lot of times people ask me, well, how do you handle, you know, for instance, if they want a shot or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the one thing that I, I say that when you're interacting with folks, you know, out in an urban environment is do not make any promises that you are not willing to keep. Because if you don't keep your promise, then it ruins it for the next guy that comes around. Okay. And uh, I, I ran into this situation a lot in New Orleans where people had promised to send people pictures and then they didn't. They didn't. And so then the guy goes, well, pff, yeah, you know, some guy took my picture the other day and he said he's going to send it to me and he didn't, you know, so I'm not interested in talking to you. That's no good. That's no good. So what I do is and what I recommend is that you carry business cards, just simple business cards, has your name, has photographer on them and has an email address. That's all you really need on there. So then I give them the business card and I say, if you want this photo, just write me an email, tell me you know, where we shot, and then I will send you the photo. And I put the ball in their court. 
Now, if they do send me an email, I actually, I get them a picture right away. Most of the time they do not, but I have set up the transaction so that, you know, I have done my part and the ball's in their court. And if they want to do their part, they can, and I will fulfill my end of the contract. And then it just eliminates me trying to write things down and do all sorts of things where I may just screw it up in all honesty. So that's the way I handle that. Very rarely, very rarely does, does anyone send me an email, ask for a picture. Very rarely. But when they do, I fulfill it. This last shot here that I want to show you on uh, portraits with permission is that sometimes if you're just hanging out, they will actually come to you. <laughs> this shot's in Las Vegas. And uh, one of the techniques that I talk about in the workshop is, you know, you don't have to be out running around all the time doing this, you know, uh, when you're out doing street photography. A lot of times a good way to go is just find an interesting place and you just park it, just park it, find a, like sitting on a bench or on you know on a wall or something like that just park it and hang out have your camera out all right and then let the world come to you you can watch the world passing by you can take pictures uh, on the x100v i can flip up uh the uh, viewfinder so i can be looking down like this and it's very non-confrontational uh, for taking photos but the other thing that happens is that people will actually come to me. They'll say, you know, that's a cool camera. And uh, the two cameras that I use for street photography is, is the Fujifilm X100V and the Olympus Pen F. Those are my two street photography cameras. And part of the reason why I like them is because they're interesting cameras. And if they're out, a lot of times they will draw the interest of people. Almost every time that I'm out shooting, someone will ask me, is that a film camera? You know, because they have the retro look or they'll go, what kind of camera is that? That is the icebreaker that they have initiated. They've initiated it. I'm just sitting there. We have a conversation and then uh, it can lead to a photo. That's what happened right here uh, with this gentleman in the camouflage. He, uh, he, I don't know what his backstory is or why, uh, he's out uh, on the streets in Las Vegas, but you know that that's where he hangs out. And he was out there, and he had an interest in photography, and he wanted to see my camera. So we we're talking and stuff. Well, this is his dad uh, that's there, and they were actually having a visit uh, when uh, I was hanging out there. And so we're talking, we're talking, and he goes, "Hey, will you do a picture of me with my dad?" And I go, "I'd love to. I'd love to." So again. I get uh, the backdrop that I want. Uh, I get a couple interesting characters and I get a nice shot that I had permission to take. And I didn't have to do anything other than, other than just sit there and uh, be, you know, a nice guy, right? You know, make eye contact, smile, you know, be engaged. Now, that being said, there will be times when folks, uh, you know, don't want their picture taken even if you're not trying to take their picture, right? Uh, I had one situation in Santa Monica uh, where I was taking pictures at the Metro Rail Station in Santa Monica. It's really a kind of a cool place. And so I was taking pictures of the, the cars. Well, you know, there are cracks in between the cars, right? Where the cars are hooked together. And on the other side, uh, someone was uh, standing there waiting to board a train. And he thought that I was taking his picture through the cracks of the cars. And so he comes around and he confronts me about this. And I go, uh, I wasn't taking your picture. And, uh, you know, I would, you know, I would let you know if I were. And um, of course, you know, some folks are just in a bad mood or have something going on uh, that's socially not um, easy to get along with. And so I had to leave the scene because he was, he was so upset that I was there with a camera. So I don't want to paint an overly rose, rosy picture in that it's always going to go perfect. It doesn't always go perfect. And uh, a lot of times uh, I'll recommend that if you're out doing street photography, it's really great to uh, travel with someone else, have someone else there with you hanging out. You know, that's, that's a nice way to go so that there are two of you, uh, you know, and it's not just you by yourself in case someone does confront you. But I will say that is rare. And of course, uh, 
always recommend staying in you know well lit and somewhat busy uh, environments. Uh, that makes it so much easier. So that is the first group of pictures, which is uh, portraits with permission. And I have to tell you, I, I really like these shots. I, I do. This guy uh, wanted to sell me that camera. He thought my, my Fuji film was a film camera. And he goes, hey, I got a film camera. You want to buy this one too? And I go, um, no, I don't, I don't want to buy that camera, but I do want to take your picture. <laughs> so he let me take his picture. Okay, so now let's go to photos that you don't have permission, you don't get permission, or you don't need permission. And you know, some of these, uh, you know, are are heartbreaking, quite frankly, to me. That when I'm out working, this is in my hometown of Santa Rosa here, and you know, this this person, I, I don't even know what they look like, but you know, this this is his day or her day. And, um, you know, it, it breaks my heart. And a lot of times people ask me, well, you know, what is your view on taking pictures of people who live on the streets? And I go, my view is that I generally don't need to do it for a couple reasons. One is because we have more than enough photography in that area. And second of all, um, you know, unless I have their permission and, you know, unless I've engaged with them, you know, I, I don't feel real good about it. But I will say that there are situations like this where it is just a fascinating shot. And to me, without hurting anyone's identity, it tells a story that I think, you know, that we're all way too familiar with. So if they're not recognizable, uh, then, you know, it is okay to go ahead and take their shot. The thing that I just stressed over and over and over again about any type of street photography is be respectful. Just be respectful. And if somehow uh, he, uh, you know, made eye contact with me and said, "Please don't take my picture," not only would I not take his picture, but if I had taken a picture and he asked me not to, I would not use that picture. I would just go ahead and let it go. A lot of times, uh, where you don't need permission is when they're just engaged in something. People are engaged in something, and it's just fascinating to me. This is in Union Square in San Francisco. And this guy had this cart going <laughs> like 30 miles an hour. It was amazing, uh, you know, what he was able to do with this cart. And so I was again, just sitting there watching the world go by. In this case, I had a Rico GR3. And I said, I, I've got to photograph this guy. He's, you know, with this backdrop and, uh, you know, with this uh, motion, it is too good to pass up. So again, we, we can't see who he is, you know, because of uh, his face is hidden, but <clears throat> it's an interesting shot to me. And uh, it is a shot that I would like, you know, just regardless, regardless of the situation, because I like the backdrop. I like what he's doing. I think the cart's interesting. And to me, it's a fascinating, fascinating shot. And I actually, I also sort of like the legs down here too. I don't know why. Some people would call that distracting. For some reason, I enjoy just seeing these legs down here mirror the action that's happening with his legs right here. This is uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, this is in the, the fashion district, which is a very difficult place for street photography because there are a lot of undocumented workers there and they are very nervous about having any cameras out. And so I, I tread very lightly in this area. And a lot of times, if I do want to take some pictures, if I do see something I want to take pictures of, I'll actually have the camera down. And, uh, you know, I've, got, I've become very adept at knowing how to line up the camera without looking in the viewfinder. The reason why I took this shot was I could just feel their pain. They're, they're having obviously some sort of argument or something is not going well today. And then, you know, it's so hard on kids whenever parents are, are, you know, having a disagreement and they're just like there. And I just, this, this shot to me, I just felt uh, all this, all this pain. And so I took it and, uh, you know, for me, every time I, I look at this, I just, I, I, I feel that, <laughs> I, I feel that. And um, also because I think that, you know, especially he's so handsome to look at and the kids are beautiful. And then the look that she's, she's giving him, 
and then I, I believe that she is pregnant also. So this is, you know, this is to me just tells a whole story right here. So um, even in situations where normally I'm going, I'm not going to shoot a whole lot. If I see something though, that I think is interesting, uh, I will photograph it. <clears throat> now, because I did have the camera down low, uh, I'm just walking. So I'm walking straight, they're walking toward me. I'm taking the picture and, you know, they don't know that I'm taking the picture and I just keep, you know, walking on through. And uh, there's a little bit of a knack to this, uh, but uh, it, it is a good technique when you're in situations where uh, you know, people may not want their photograph taken. This is a public place, however. This is in uh, Santa Monica, and this is just funny to me. Uh, they were vaping, and, uh, you know, it was raining, and they want, I guess they really needed a smoke. And so they came outside, they put this towel over their head, and then uh, they're they're vaping there so that they can have a, a smoke and they're presumably going to go back inside and have lunch or whatever. And uh, I put this in the category of, you know, people just do the, the funniest things to me uh, when I'm out in the world sometimes. And uh, obviously, uh, no one's recognizable here. You don't really need to, you know, worry about identity or anything like this. But uh, it's, it's really a, a shot. This shot could have gone in sign of the times. Uh, but, uh, you know, I put it here in portraits that where you don't need permission. This is inside the Met here, and this is one of the first shots that you'll see where I use motion. And I like to use motion a lot in uh, street photography shots. You're going to see it in some upcoming images. And the reason why, like, for instance, the reason why I like it here is because it really helps isolate the main subject. So if the main subject is not moving and the world is moving around him or her, then you can really isolate what's going on. And, you know, the eye will go right to the, the main subject first and then sort of enjoy what's happening around uh, that subject. So um, I love this, this technique a lot. And a lot of times what I'll do is just set the camera on any stable surface at all. I don't carry a tripod in here. I'll have a little tripod in my back pocket, but they're not going to let me set it up inside the Met. Um, and uh, so I just find a surface to set it on uh, and I find the shot and uh, then I just press the shutter button, usually using a self timer, and then just let it happen. Just uh, let it happen. Again, here's another shot. I've set it on the table and uh, I'm letting the, the world go by, but then uh, this mother and son uh, were interesting to me. She obviously knows I'm taking her picture. After I took the shot, I just waved at her. I go, hi. I go, it's really pretty. And I go, is it OK? You know, like that. And they just smile and just say, yeah, just don't take any more kind of thing. And uh, I go on my way. But uh, I like the combination of, of, you know, using a little bit of motion, using a big backdrop. You don't always have to have your subject in the middle of the frame. You know, if, if you're isolating the subject because you have motion and other things going on, the viewer will find the subject. They'll find it because that's going to be the sharp thing. And especially when they're making eye contact like this, our eyes go directly to other sets of eyes. So uh, this is uh, uh, kind of fun. And I did, by the way, stop shooting. You know, after she smiled, we're all OK, but I'm not going to push it, right? I got a shot, move on. Don't torture people, don't torture people. Uh, this is in uh, San Francisco. And uh, this is with uh, also with a GR3 that does really nice monochromes. The Ricoh GR3 and the Fujifilm X100s do just fantastic monochromes right in the camera. I absolutely love them. And uh, the nice thing about the Ricoh is it has a little wider lens, 28 millimeters, but the, the third version is image stabilized. So you can, sensor based, so you can really uh, you know, push the envelope a little bit in what you're doing with handheld photography. Uh, so uh, I love uh, being able to shoot shots like this in lighting where I'm pushing the envelope. And I think the other device that is really helpful for urban photography right now is the iPhone 12 Pro Max, you know, and, and uh, 
the reason being that it is very capable of doing shots like this. And at the same time, it doesn't attract very much attention. People are used to people shooting with smartphones all the time. And um, I actually have a workshop there. I think there's going to be a link in the chats. But the workshop, the online workshop, is about using a smartphone with just one camera for very nimble photography, but a very professional workflow using uh, Pro Raw and all the tools that are available to us now. Travel very light and come away with very solid results. And I want to talk just a little bit about black and white. I'm in the middle of a black and white uh, online workshop right now. In fact, right after this talk, I go right to uh, one of our check-in chats. The way you do the workshops is that they actually span about four weeks. We have photo assignments and check-ins and stuff along the way. And then we have you know final sharing on the last day. And uh, we're doing black and white photography right now, which I absolutely love and I love it for street photography, both the kind of black and white that's this very gritty sort of tri-X uh, approach to black and white, but I also like black and white that has you know the beautiful neutral tones as well. This was at the beginning of the pandemic in San Francisco. Um, I actually have an article uh, on medium.com talking about from LA to San Francisco and me photographing uh, both places, uh, LA at the beginning of the pandemic and then San Francisco, right before the first shelter in place was lifted. Of course, you know, we've had subsequent shelter in places since. And this is an Apple store that is normally just absolutely crazy full, busy in the middle of the day. No one there, but some guy, you know, that, that works there at the Apple store. <laughs> and um, for any, anyone that hangs out in Apple stores, uh, you know, you just go, wow, there's the pandemic right there. I also like for street photography and especially combined with black and white where I actually hold the camera down at my side while I'm walking. And then I, I've got the knack down where I just angle it up a little bit and sort of shoot upward uh, at, uh, at subjects as I'm walking by. And uh, this is uh, one of those kinds of shots. And part of what I like, and you know, not this isn't everyone's cup of tea, of course, but I do like a little bit of the skewed perspective. I don't always feel the need to have everything absolutely perpendicular uh, in these shots. I feel like it gives it a little uh, dynamic feel to it. Again, sign of the times, they're wearing masks and the streets are fairly empty. And so <laughs> black and white to me sort of um, sums up the mood of all of this. And here we are in Union Square again at lunchtime. At lunchtime, in the middle of the week, the square is almost always just filled with people. And it's a great place to hang out. It's a great public space. Lunchtime during uh, the pandemic, uh, one gentleman there uh, having his lunch in a completely empty Union Square. The stores aren't open. And uh, you know, talk about a, a moment in time. And I think black and white is really nice for this. So. Uh, you know, again, I'm shooting these in camera uh, with Fujifilm. I use uh, uh, Acros a lot of times with the yellow filter. And on the Pen F, uh, they have monochrome two setting, I believe, which is very much like Tri-X. And you can use the dial on the front of the camera just to switch over uh, to black and white on the Pen F, which is uh, very super handy. All right, let's talk a little bit about public art. Public art is fascinating to me. Uh, I photograph it both with people and without people. And the reason why I like it is because to me it has a, a cultural statement. I mean, this is what artists are doing, whether they're artists that are bona fide, artists that are doing it in the middle of the night. It doesn't make any difference, you know, what their status is. They're creating art in public. And uh, I think that in a presentation, when you give a presentation, when you're talking about, here's my visit to LA, here's my visit to San Francisco, here's my visit to New York, you want to have a mix of shots. I, you know, no matter how good your people shots are or your architecture is, that you want to have you know, some public art mixed in there. You want to have variety to help keep the viewer's interest. Public art is just a, a great way to, to go about it. 
and uh i do have people in the shot sometimes i actually like it if if it works out and the, the way that the people come into the shots is literally that they come into the shot so and this is a a really easy way to have people in your street photography shots is that you're setting up a shot you know you're just setting up the shot in this case this particular scene which i thought was interesting and then someone walks into the scene while you're taking the shot and especially if you're composing it on an lcd you know looking down at it then if someone walks into your frame while you're taking a shot then you know okay that's fine you know that's uh that's uh, it all works everyone benefits and a lot of times after one of these shots they will notice that uh i was taking a picture and then they'll, they'll be sorry they'll go i'm sorry and i go no no thank you thank you it looked cool with you in it everyone smiles and we uh, go about our business but uh, that's a really good technique is to just and a lot of people advise if you if you want very interesting shots where the whole shot works start by finding the scene that you want setting that up photograph that scene and then let people come into the scene and photograph them coming into the scene it's a very very good technique for street photography another thing that i like uh, with public art is to do juxtaposition I love juxtaposition in general. I think it's uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, you know, <laughs> here they are. He's looking at uh, the photographer. The photographer is taking their picture, and I think that people also help by providing some scale to the shot as well. Now you really get an idea of you know the size of this mural because you have a person in the shot that you know you have you know some idea of the size of this person. And then sometimes just the public art itself, which is, um, some, boy, sometimes some cities have great, very interesting public art. And by the way, on purpose, I got this, this blue line in here. It had been raining, as you can tell. So the asphalt's nice and black, which I absolutely love. I love black asphalt like that. And uh, I love the blue lines. And I thought the blue lines worked with some of the colors in the public art. So instead of just cropping it down at the base of the bricks, I let that black kind of provide a foundation with the blue lines that help tie into the rest of the shot. Again, shooting art, having someone come through. He had a, he had a bag that just worked perfectly with the colors and the artwork, uh, which I appreciated very much. And then uh, this is in Santa Rosa. Um, this one was also with uh, Rico. And uh, again, great monochrome mode on the Rico. It just makes these lovely black and whites. Uh, a couple weeks after I photographed these murals, um, someone defaced them and, and basically ruined them. Uh, ruined both the murals, both this one here and the one of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the background. And um, it was just, it just felt so bad because you know these these are beautiful, beautiful uh, buildings, and you know obviously there had been permission to do the artwork there. So um, you know I had the photo, so I sent it to the artist. There was a story in the newspaper, and I sent it to the artist, and uh, it was a couple actually, and they appreciated you know having the shot, and they also appreciated the empathy for having their artwork ruined. So uh, public art to me is just uh, another aspect of the story another way to add useful information to the story and then finally architecture and i love i love architecture uh i wish that uh modern ar architecture was uh a little bit more thoughtful and not quite so uh so 100 cost effective practical uh although uh you know we are seeing some trends where uh, there's some nice uh, new buildings going up that that have some wonderful design as well but uh architecture from all angles and you know high angles are are great for architecture as are street level angles and you know so that's what i really try to think about is like okay, how do i want to photograph this do i want to be down low shooting up do I want to be up high shooting down? And a lot of times, you know, whatever, if, if I can get a high vantage point, I'm going to take it. I'm going to go for it. 
And uh, if, if I don't, if I can't find that, then I'm definitely going to try to find an interesting spot uh, on the street, maybe get down low. In this case, I set the camera on a barrier. This is, I think, the Pen F and did a long exposure. And another point that I want to make about architecture, it doesn't have to be just architecture. I mean, you can combine other elements in the shot. You can do other things to help, uh, you know, complement the architecture or, you know, maybe make the overall shot a bit more interesting. Another tip on architecture, because of the type of lighting that cities use, it gets a lot of times this very kind of yucky yellow green glow to it that I find very unattractive. Uh, you, if you're shooting raw, of course, you can tone that down uh, in post. But a fun thing to do to play with while you're out shooting urban architecture is set your white balance to tungsten and, and get a whole different look for it. And you know, sometimes I really like this, this blue look. With some shots, I think it really uh, complements uh, what's going on. So you know, play with your white balance. Don't just take the lighting that they give you. You're the artist, you can influence that shot and you know, play around with this. And in this case, I, I like the tungsten approach a lot. And then um, just buildings that you love. <laughs> you see a building and you go, God, that is, I like that building so much then just hang out and you know, either come back if the lighting's not right, if you, you know, get to spend some time in the city or do the best you can at the moment, but don't you know, shoot as many buildings and as many things as you want. You can decide later on what to include uh, in your final presentation or whatever you happen to be sharing. But you know, buildings to me, and especially buildings that have this sort of character, um, you know, they, they tell me a story, this is in Oakland, California. And suddenly, you know, I, when I saw this building and buildings like it, I go, you know, I, I see Oakland a little differently. It's, it's different than just the headlines, you know, that we see sometimes. Oakland has this history that's, that's quite beautiful and quite rich. And I think that, you know, buildings can help us balance out that story about any city, whether it's uh, New Orleans or New York or Oakland or whatever it happens to be. And then of course, buildings in black and white are a blast, especially if you put on the red filter, you know, so you make that sky go nice and dark and you have some clouds to play with. Uh, you know, you can have a lot of fun. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, especially if you, you know, when I shoot people, when I take pictures of people, it takes a lot of energy. It, it takes a lot of energy. And, uh, you know, sometimes buildings can be a little bit of a rest. All right, finally, sign of the times, sign of the times. Uh, and these are just shots that, that, you know, that I like because uh, 20 years from now, you know, we, we may not be as obsessed with our phones as we are right now. And, you know, so people are hanging out together, they're eating together in restaurants and they're both on their phone, right? That kind of thing. And so I, I like capturing things that are signs of the times uh, you know, because I think, I sort of feel like that even a few years from now, I may look at these shots and go, you know, wow, that was interesting. Uh, remember when we got to go to sporting events and <laughs> just be uh, hanging out and just, you know, just having fun, you know, and, and enjoying, you know, the thrill of being in a, a building with uh, 15,000 people. Um, our cars, you know, are definitely signs of the times, you know, people go, well, you know, I don't want cars in the shot. And a lot of times I'm going, I want cars in the shot because I love looking at shots from 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking at the cars in those shots and then, you know, that doesn't mean you can't play with it too. You can't have some fun with this, you know, motion is so fun in street photography and, uh, you know, panning technique is great. Uh, so this guy obviously <laughs> has an opinion about me photographing him as he's going by on his bike. Uh, so I get the motion from the panning. I get uh, his personality coming through. Uh, obviously he kept going. He, it wasn't that big of a deal. He's just giving me some grief on this shot. But uh, you know, using uh, motion along with this, uh, uh, I think really adds some life to these shots. And um, 
you know, the Fujifilm has a built-in ND filter, which is super helpful, electronic ND filter. So all you really need is a, a steady place to set the camera down uh, and then enable that uh, ND filter. I think it's, they change it. I think the current one is three stops, uh, which is good. And then uh, just let that long shutter speed uh, go and, and have some fun and get some motion in your shots. Uh, I, this is with a Sony actually shot at, I don't know, ISO 64,000 or something nutty like that. And um, <clears throat> again, uh, this couldn't happen right now or shouldn't happen right now. But, uh, you know, of a year ago, we wouldn't think twice about this kind of event. And then, you know, there's a, just this sad thing that's going on, uh, you know, with the public unrest uh, where, you know, I don't, I don't think both sides are still able to quite communicate with one another. And a lot of times shop owners are caught in between. Uh, the shop owner just had to board up everything to protect his business. And uh, again, sign of the time, sign of things that are going on in our society right now, uh, issues that we need to work out. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's not as in your face. It can be more subtle. You know, there can be little things going on all around you and you go, oh, okay. Probably wouldn't have seen that, uh, you know, two years ago. People wearing masks right now, you know, just a normal, these guys are just having a, a normal little business meeting at a Chipotle, I think. And, um, you know, wearing masks, uh, iPad out, sign of the times, an interaction almost six feet apart. Uh, but again, you know, wearing masks. And again, I like black and white on uh, the shot as well. I think it, it adds a little something to it. Times Square, you know, uh, Times Square where when do you think we'll see this again? I mean, right now you look at this shot or at least I look at this shot and I go, oh my God, I'm so, <laughs> the shot makes me nervous. <laughs> you, know? you know, talk about a super spreader event. I mean, look at this, but um, you know, we may get back to this someday. Right now, this is not our time. You know, this is more our time right now, but we may get back to this someday as well. So I think sign of the times are a nice thing to include. All right, so I'm going to stop the share for a second. I just want to show you a couple of cameras and then we'll take some questions. All right, so here is uh, the Fujifilm. Uh, this is the X100V. I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. The thing about this camera that I really like was well, a number of things. Uh, one is I, I love the size, it has a great lens. Uh, you can either just set it on automatic everything seriously automatic everything and it does a fantastic job and or you have complete control including an aperture ring you can set a shutter speed dial uh, in all those variables the ISL they can either be on automatic or they can you know you can take control in any combination thereof the other thing that they added with the 100V is the uh, tilting screen which uh, super helpful. I, I really don't want a camera anymore that doesn't have a tilting screen to tell you the truth. Uh, and then I put a grip on it and this is an Arca Swiss, uh, you know, uh, base plate down here. So if I do put it on a tripod, I can just put it on a tripod uh, right away. Uh, this is uh, a magical camera. And the part of the magic is Fujifilm's color science from years and years of, of creating film all that color science is in this camera. The film simulations are fantastic. Shoot RAW plus JPEG. Your RAW has whatever film simulation. I mean, your JPEG has whatever film simulation you set up and your RAW is your RAW. The uh, other camera that I think is uh, really useful for urban photography right now is the iPhone. Uh, now with uh, Pro RAW, we have a device that can have a professional workflow. We have three lenses. So here I have an equivalent 35 millimeter f2. And then here I have a ultra wide, a 23 millimeter wide and a 65 millimeter uh, telephoto, uh, all at relatively fast apertures with computational photography science behind it. So between these two devices, 
I can cover just about everything that I need to do for street photography. And I have a workflow that works fantastic and they work together, they talk to each other. So I can just pull over, get a cup of coffee, uh, process images on this and uh, you know uh, have them uploaded to whatever I happen to be doing. So I think in the world of street photography right now, it's uh, very interesting. I do recommend uh, a couple things. One is be safe. Always be aware of your surroundings. Be very aware of your surroundings. Keep your gear tight, right? Don't, I, I don't like to carry a camera bag or anything that uh, attracts attention. Or if I do, it's a camera bag that doesn't look like a camera bag. And, um, you know, and be safe. Always make that your first thing. And when you step into the street to get a shot, it, you have to have a spotter. Do not be stepping off the curve to, curb to take shots without someone looking out for you because things happen just like that. And you don't want you know, that shot to be the last one that you take, okay? So that is my approach to street photography and uh, let's do some questions. Hi, Derek, I have a question right off the bat for you. You say that those two cameras talk to one another. Is there an app or are they talking through Wi-Fi? How are they talking to one another? I, I'm sorry, I just turned my volume on. Uh, you're talking about the two cameras, the yes. iPhone? Yes, so uh, all the major camera manufacturers have apps that allow you to, to talk to each other. Fujifilm's app has come a long ways. The Olympus app is also quite good. So, and you know, so you, they talk to each other very well. You, you have some control over what comes over. One thing I will mention that I really like about, especially with the Fujifilm camera, is that they, I like cameras that talk via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi both because with the modern Bluetooth connection, the camera and the phone can be in constant conversation. It, the Bluetooth is sophisticated enough to where it doesn't drain things quickly. And you get all of the photos, all the photos that I take with this are geotagged as well, even though this doesn't have a you know, um, lo location built into it, they're geotagged because of the iPhone. So uh, you know, there are some real benefits to using the two devices together and the apps by the manufacturers are quite good. Wonderful, that's good news. Uh, Alan Weinstein, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, uh, I, I love this presentation. It was fabulous. I empathize with many, many, <laughs> many of the shots you took. Um, but one area that I didn't see you emphasize, and I'm wondering why, is reflection pictures. I love to take reflection pictures, either reflections off of a body of water, or in fact, off of a glass building, uh, the reflective view and the actual view. So do you have a collection of reflection pictures? I do, I do. I, I share your love of reflection pictures uh, too. Yeah, I mean, at some point, uh, I have so many passions that uh, I could keep you here all night. Um, but I, I agree, and I'm glad you brought this up because I think reflection pictures in the city, they're, you know, when I was talking about architecture where sometimes you just want to take a rest from trying to interact with, with the, the world and people. And I think reflection pictures, you know, work on so many different levels. Uh, they can be very artistic. Uh, they allow you to relax as you're mainly working with things and not people. And there's so much going on. And once you get your eye attuned to that, whether it's, uh, you know, windows in a, in a building or water on the ground or uh, a car window, capturing the city uh, uh, skyline, uh, you can really get some very artistic stuff. So I'm really glad you brought that up. It's another thing that I would include in my favorite shots in urban environments. Just a little tagline on the reflection pictures. I got a hint one day that one great technique for reflection pictures or for buildings is to hold the camera up against the building. And then half of the picture is the reflection picture and then the other half is the actual uh, scene. If you hold your camera right up against a building and you align it correctly, you get both of those in one picture. That's fun. That's fun. Uh, there's some good underwater shots that way too, where you work with the water line. Uh, another thing I would add is uh, it's good to have a polarizer uh, with you, uh, a circular polarizer. And then sometimes you can control the amount of uh, reflection that's happening. And that, that can be quite nice too. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I don't see any hands raised. Are there any other questions? And if not, can right now, can you give me the name of that first camera you held up there? The, the small, yeah, here? that one. Yes. Yeah. This is a Fujifilm X100V, 24 megapixels, APS-C sensor. So you, you got a nice sensor in it. Uh, equivalent of a 35 millimeter f2 lens which 35 millimeter lenses i think are the most versatile mm -hmm. uh, for urban photography um, and it's it's just uh, beautiful <laughs> built-in flash by the way it has a hybrid viewfinder which you don't get on uh, i don't i can't think of any other camera right now so you can switch between a pure optical viewfinder to an electronic viewfinder with just a little switch right here you can go back and forth so whatever works best for you while you're composing the shot, uh, I use them both. But you know, and, and it's amazing how good the electronic viewfinder is, and it's amazing how good the optical viewfinder is. And then you still have the uh, tilting LCD on the back. Wonderful. Thank you so much. About thirteen hundred uh, bucks. Okay. Thank I have, you. I Marilyn. Have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, George. Oh. Oh, was well, it Marilyn? Or Marilyn was first. Okay. Okay. Your hand. okay, go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, my question is, could you talk a little bit more about the technique you use to get motion and still shot in one picture, like the people on the boardwalk uh, walk, yeah. um, walking and some still? Yeah, you know, it, that's, that's really a fun technique. So a lot of times uh, as you're watching the world, and this really is easiest to do when you park it and you're, you know, kind of letting the world happen around you, you will notice that some people become fixed in what they're doing. Uh, maybe they're, they're reading something on their phone, or maybe they're just, you know, looking off like this, something like that, uh, while the world is swirling around them. This is, this is a great opportunity for that shot. So then all you have to do is, depending on what kind of camera you're using, is slow down that shutter speed to, I, I like to get it down to an eighth of a second or, or so if I can. And that's why having a neutral density filter built into the camera like you have on the X100V is handy sometimes so that you, know, you can, if you have a, a fair amount of light, you can get that shutter speed down a bit. And then what'll happen if the person's fixed and if they're looking at something at an eighth of a second or even a 15th of a second, uh, you're not going to get much motion in them. Just make sure you're focused on them. But the things that are moving quickly, cars and people and all that, will definitely get uh, that motion blur. And then the other thing to think about is where does the person that's going to be sharp and focused, where are they placed on the screen? You want to have them in an interesting spot, uh, whether you use rule of thirds or, or you know, however you kind of think about composition but have them in an interesting spot and then just let the world swirl around them. The main trick, of course, is getting that shutter speed down low and then um, you know, being sharp on the person that you want in focus. Derek, why the, uh, tw the 12 uh, Pro Max versus uh the 12 Pro. Uh, you just get a, a, a little bit more in terms of uh, photography. You get a you get sensor-based image stabilization for that 23 millimeter lens, which is a really good lens. Um, you get a couple other little perks. I will admit, uh, I normally carry an iPhone 10 uh, in my pocket. I love the size of the iPhone 10. I, I love photography with the iPhone 10. And in my workshops, I, I have a really nice raw workflow for, you know, the 10 and the 11 as well. Uh, but with the, with the Pro Max, I mean, seriously, I'm buying a, a digital camera that also has a phone built into it. Uh, it is just amazing. But I like both. And you're right. I, I, did, kind of, I did kind of really look at that closely. I just went for the Pro Max because of the couple additional features, but the Pro 12 does Pro Raw, and at the end of the day, that is really what you want. Thank you. 
have another Alan. question if you're open to additional questions from people have asked before. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Al. <clears throat> uh, I'm wondering how much time you spend in processing compared to actually taking the picture. I spend much more time in the processing mode than I ever spend in the taking mode. Do you do the same thing? Yeah, uh, you know, it really varies. Um, I think people who loved processing, which, you know, a lot of, a lot of photographers, that's their favorite part. Uh, I'm, I'm a true believer in then just process as much as you want and have as much fun with it because for a lot of photographers, I feel like that's the cr uh, creative side of the, uh, of the action. And some street photographers will tell you, no, nah, it's gotta be right out of the camera or it's not authentic. And uh, I don't subscribe to that at all. I think we're artists and I think we don't, let's not kid ourselves. It's our interpretation of the world. Even if we don't post process at all, we're still composing and deciding what to shoot. So I, I like uh, post-processing. A lot of times though, um, a lot of shots that you saw don't have a lot of post because uh, once I get in the moment, and this is where I, I really feel like having a camera that you bond with is so important. If I'm shooting in, uh, let's say, Acros plus yellow filter uh, film simulation with the Fuji film camera, and I'm seeing the world in this beautiful black and white, and, and, and I'm really in the zone, then a lot of times my captures are just fine, and I don't really have to do a whole lot. Maybe a little bit of cropping. Maybe I'll bump up the contrast just a tad. Maybe I'll open up a shadow just a wee bit, uh, something like that. But uh, when I really get in a groove, I don't have to post-process as much. So it really depends on how the shooting's going. Seems like on hard shooting days, I post-process more. And on easy shooting days where the world's coming to me, I process less. But I have no bias whatsoever against post-processing. I think it's all part of the artistic process. Derek, what, Derek, what software uh, do you prefer for your post processing? It depends on the camera, believe it or not. Um, for the Fujifilm, Capture One Pro 20 or now 21 is amazing for Fujifilm cameras. Uh, if you shoot Fujifilm, you really need to do the trial on the software because remember when I talked about all those film simulations, they're all built into the software Capture One working with Fujifilm uh, to do that. Plus, it in, uh, the raw interpretation of the raw files is, is incredible. Far and away, in my opinion, better than Lightroom's version. Although Lightroom and Fujifilm have been working better together lately. So I love Capture One Pro uh, for that. But for the iPhone, uh, I love photos for Mac OS. I honestly do. And part of the reason why I like it is, you know, I love the whole cloud connection, all that. The tools are good. It actually has one of the best retouch tools in the business, but the photo extensions that you can use with photos, so seamless and so powerful. So I add Luminar 4, uh, DxO uh, photo extension. Um, there's a couple others that, that I use quite a bit. And I have all the power of, uh, you know, of all these apps in a very easy to use package that is cloud-based. And then whatever edits I do on one machine uh, is propagated to all the other machines. Um, so I photos for Mac OS is my other favorite. Obviously I use Lightroom because I, you know, I teach. And so I have to be versatile with Lightroom. And the thing that I really love Lightroom for are photo merges, which we didn't talk about today either. But if you want to shoot a high dynamic range shot or a shot where you really want to expand that tonal range, I love the way Lightroom does photo merges. Uh, I think it's very professional. It gives you that DNG file that now you can do just about anything that you want with it. And Lightroom is also a very good mobile uh, app, you know, mobile suite of apps. So uh, a lot of people come to my workshops with Lightroom and, you know, you just go, yeah, you know, excellent choice as well. But those are my three favorites, Lightroom, uh, Capture One Pro, and Photos for Mac OS. Thank you. I'd like to add to that, that the Lightroom mobile app is actually free. 
You do not have to have a Creative Cloud subscription to use it. And it has some amazing features on it. And you can bring your images to and from the camera roll on your iPhone. Great point. Great point. I might add for a real amateur like me, I mean, I use Preview a lot. Preview has a lot of power in it. It does. Know, really for a very simple photo processing program, Preview has a lot going for it. Yeah, if you go to that tools, you go to that tools thing, you go, wow, there's a lot here. Uh, I do all my presentations on Preview. I love it. <laughs> it's great. Any other questions? I have one other uh, <laughs> Common question. I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Go, go I'm ahead. Sorry Alan. to analyze this, but this is something I do a lot of. So uh, this was a great presentation. Uh, I take a lot of pictures on a bus, where I oh. take pictures of other passengers on the bus. Sometimes I ask for permission. You have permission. Sometimes I really don't. So I have this large collection of bus pictures. Do you have <laughs> a collection of of pictures you've taken of people on the bus? I like trains too. Trains yeah. too. Yes, I do. And um, one of my favorite uh, train shots, which is you know analogous to what you're doing, uh, was in Japan because in Japan, uh, at least when I was there, uh, they didn't make eye contact on public transportation. So you have this whole row, and all the heads are down at like a precise angle, and it was just fascinating to me. Uh, you know, that shot. And then, you know, of course, you have this cool train and all the other stuff. So um, I do think they're fun. And, and, and I do, and you, know, you can use that LCD to get the angle that you want. Another tip, if you're riding the bus or the train, and you have a device that will shoot at 120 frames a second, whether it's a, you know, iPhone or a, a camera, you know, that allows the slow-mo if you put the camera right up against the window when you're going through an interesting area, shoot at 120 frames a second or slow-mo video, it's, it's really can be very interesting. And, and can, if you're doing a little video, something or other, or you're dropping some video into a slide presentation, you drop that in and uh, people usually go, wow, that's, that's really neat. Uh, <laughs> so that's, an, that's another good public transportation tip. Thank you. Conrad, are you here? And if you're here, do you have any questions? No, thanks, George. I, I think this is an excellent presentation. Uh, I, I just one comment, sort of, is I, I tend to like long uh, lenses to get candids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you seem to be uh, in the other extreme. Uh, you come in. You're right. Um, I, think, I think long lenses are fine. If, if you're engaged with the subject, in other words, if the subject knows you're taking their pictures. As a street photographer, the, my concern is that a long lens can lead to a very embarrassing situation, a very awkward situation. Because if you're taking a picture of someone with a long lens without them knowing it, and then they catch you, it's a, it's, it's a, extremely awkward extremely awkward so that that i i just like avoiding that if i can at all whereas you know when i have a shorter lens i'm more immediate there's nowhere to hide you know i you know right away you know i'm i'm up front that i'm taking your picture and you know they have an opportunity to wave me off or whatever and i just feel that it's it's a little bit more fair um for portraits where people know I'm taking their pictures, I love long lenses uh, at wide apertures, of course. Uh, they're so much fun. Thank you. Derek, Derek, Derek. Have, oh, I'm I sorry. Have, Go ahead. Go that's ahead. all right. Uh, some people have the extended lenses that they use with their iPhone models. Do you use those or do you find with the 12 Pro Max that you don't need to use any additional lenses? Uh, one of the things I love about the Pro Max is I don't need to use any additional lenses because as few things that I have to carry as, as possible, you know, I think it really helps me. Prior to this, back when I had like the iPhone 4S and those, I use those lenses all the time. I love the wide ones, especially. I thought they were really cool. Uh, but I lost them. I had to use a special case. And, uh, you know, I'm just really thankful now that... Um, 
you know, those accessories are built into the camera. I'm not against them. I just keep losing them. <laughs> <laughs> I have Thank a lot you. of trouble lining them up also. Yeah, when there's, there's lining that up too. Properly is a complicated mess. <laughs> All right, we have five minutes. Eric, can uh, I, I like, ask you, sorry. Go ahead. Eric, go can ahead. I ask you uh, what app you recommend for shooting raw on uh, iPhones pre the iPhone 12? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like, let me pull up my phone here. I'll give you a couple that, that I've had really good results with. See, I, I mean, I still have my iPhone 10 here. It's just, this is a, it's a great camera. I mean, seriously, it's a, it's a wonderful camera uh, on here. Uh, so um, obviously, I love Halid. You know, H A L I D E. They're they're fantastic, and they understand the inner workings of iPhone cameras uh, big time. Um, but I've also had very good luck with uh, Camera Plus Two, and uh, also another app called Pro Camera, all one word. Those are the three apps that I use most for shooting uh, raw on there. And then as was mentioned earlier, uh, the Lightroom app, um, the mobile app, does a very good job of capturing raw and it puts you right in the Lightroom workflow too. So those would be the four that I'd recommend uh, prior to uh, Pro Raw. Brilliant, thank you. Mm -hmm. George, you had a question? Yeah, Derek, if you had a dream, uh, what would you design the next iPhone to do that uh, hasn't been done yet? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, you know, my big beef with the iPhone is that the filters suck on there. I mean, really, when you're, when you're used to shooting uh, with Olympus cameras and Fujifilm cameras, as I work with, and you have these wonderful film simulation filters built right into it. And then you go to the filters on an iPhone and I felt like I'm, I'm going back to 1990, you know, um, I really think that I would like them to look at color science a little bit more, not color science, just for getting, you know, having the, the photographer come away with a shot that looks right. That's great. And I appreciate all the work they've done there, but I would love some color science for creativity, some film, you know, uh, emulsion, some film simulations, something where I could use my iPhone to create things like I can with uh, my other cameras. Very good. Uh, any more questions? I don't see any hands raised, George. Uh, Carl, do you have a Carl? You have a question? No, I just want to say thanks for the presentation. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. It's, yeah, this uh, was a uh, this was a great, great, outstanding presentation, and we really can appreciate. We really appreciated the fact, especially considering the date. And the time of the year and everything that you are you have and time uh, of the morning uh, too <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know i notified derek like 10 months ago yeah and he said how do i know what i'm going to be doing on that day <laughs> but True. we kept we kept in touch and and it and it worked out and uh i don't think our people realized what it takes to get speakers like uh, Derek and um, line them up, you know, almost a year in advance, but we really appreciate it. And uh, we want to open up uh, 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 the, the audio for any feedback from the audience. Yes, Just, please. I, appreciate, please thank unmute you yourself. Please unmute yourselves and let Derek know how much you appreciate it. The presentation. Well done, Derek, and Great presentation. Fantastic. It was fabulous. I love Thank it. you very much. Excellent. Well, by the way, there'll be a survey today, so please look out for it. Thank you. And George, and I want Christmas. to thank you for the effort you do in bringing us these speakers every week. I mean, I'm sure this doesn't happen by accident. I'm sure you put a lot of time into that. So I appreciate Alan. You don't realize today that you have become a speaker sometime in the year 2021. We want to see your bus. We want to see your bus pictures. Okay, we'll see. That'd be fun. I, I like to see those myself. <laughs> All right, I have uh, I have an online workshop in uh, check in here in 14 minutes. So oh. I'm going to have to bid you all adieu. Thank you, Derek.
take a look at if you're there. interested. Take a look at the workshop that uh, I have in the link in there. My online workshops are really fun, and my uh, my audience uh, enjoy them a lot. So maybe you would. Too. Yeah, they really are. They're outstanding. Yeah. And um, so try to stay in touch with Derek. He really does some outstanding workshops. All righty. Cheers, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.